Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Okay, we're here with Alana Silber, who is the CEO of Sharsheret, which is a terrific organization that we're going to learn a lot about today. And Sharsheret, of course, has been our sponsor for our three-week-long podcast mini-series on cancer and women. And Alana, thank you so much for agreeing to come on the Health of Women podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for hosting Sharsheret and hosting me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share important information with your listeners. That's great. And as we were talking about offline. You're not only the CEO of Sharshared, you're also, you're in the family for the MFM Associates family link, right? So that's my fun fact. Thanks to you and your incredible team, I am very blessed to have four grandchildren that were delivered at your practice. So thank you, two boys and two girls. And my daughters are raving about their medical team and the care that they've gotten. And as a grandparent, I get to enjoy it in a different way than I did when I had my own kids years ago. So interesting, because we were, you know, talking and when you mentioned that your three daughters go here, I was like, huh, what, what? (laughs) I was like, I didn't believe it because we don't we don't always know the grandparents are, but this is it's amazing. As I said, you have wonderful daughters. We love, you know, having them in our practice. And if they happen to be listening to you, they should be very proud of you as well. Thank you. I appreciate that and really appreciate it. Not only my own girls, but a whole circle of their friends are also very grateful to you and your practice for bringing these wonderful children into the world. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Alana Silber? Where are you from? How'd you get into this, into Sharshared, into this line of work in general? The natural question that people always ask me as the CEO of a national breast cancer and ovarian cancer organization is what's my connection? Generally, advocacy organizations are run by people who have been directly affected. And the truth is that every single one of us is directly affected by breast cancer or ovarian cancer. We know somebody out there, either a relative, a friend, a colleague who's had breast cancer or who is at genetic risk. So I personally have not had breast cancer. But about 18 years ago, I was living in a small community where I still live here in northern New Jersey. There was a young woman coming to speak about an organization that she was starting. She was starting Sharsharat. She was a young Jewish mom who was a rising attorney. She had clerked for Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she was 28 years old, had two young children, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And at the time, she had a good medical team in place, but she was looking for support as a young woman, someone who could speak with her, who would help guide her through balancing career and cancer, raising a young family, intimacy with her partner, and really managing all this, all that was going on. And there were plenty of offers for her to speak with older women, aunts and grandparents, but really no other young woman. And fortunately, or unfortunately, she was introduced to another young mom who carried her through those harrowing days before surgery through treatment. And she looked at this other woman and said, you know, you got me through this, but no one else from an organizational perspective was able to do this. Let's start our own organization. And if we could help five women a year, that would be success. So they started Sharsharet, which is Hebrew for the word chain. And they started out connected. And that's how the name came about because these two women were connected like a chain and supporting each other. That year they started, this was about 2001. And their goal was for five women. And now fast forward, we've supported over 16,000 women through this support network and this national organization. So I actually heard this story from the founder. Her name was Rochelle Shoreth in my local community. And as a younger woman at the time, I felt compelled to get involved. And I started as a volunteer. And then Rochelle looked at me and said, you know, the women are calling and we want to develop programs. I actually have an MBA in healthcare that I got when I was working at Mount Sinai Hospital all in more of a support services role, not in a medical role. So I have an MBA in healthcare and a strong ties in the community. And I decided to work there and I worked with Rochelle. And again, fast forward, you know, 19 years later, we now have 35 people working for Sharsharad and five offices in New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Florida, and California. And what we're doing now is we provide this one-on-one emotional support mental health counseling, financial subsidies, 
and community education. When you're talking about Rochelle, I met Rochelle. I'm actually friends with her sister. And that was sort of my first introduction. Was her sister and I are contemporaries, you know, went to camp together. I've, I've known her for a long time. But I was on a panel in Williamsburg, panel for women's health. And it was, you know, 500, 1,000, you know, Hasidic women. And Rochelle's there to talk about breast cancer. And I was there to talk about pregnancy. And we spoke for a while. And she was unbelievable. What a force when she came into a room. And to think that someone at age, you know, in her 20s who, A, was young, but B, was going through breast cancer herself, had the wherewithal to start an organization is really unique, obviously. Yeah. And I think that that's the energy that still continues through today. And also the goal of the organization, it's really to empower women to take control of a situation that seems so out of control and take the necessary steps to lead a healthier future and a healthier life going forward. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, I know that Rochelle sort of led the organization, either actually led it. There was a couple of years where she wasn't, but basically she was running the organization until she passed away several years ago. And she was, I guess, the executive director, it was called. And what was it like for you to step into the role? I know it's a different title, but to step into that role of running an organization, following in her footsteps, that must have been a very uncomfortable transition, I would say. The challenge was that when she passed away, Rochelle was, in some respects, the poster child for breast cancer. And to lose the leader of an organization to an illness for which she started a support organization was emotionally challenging for a lot of the women and families we serve and for the community at large. So I think my focus at the time was to reassure the community that although Rochelle's story ended with her passing, that's not every woman's story. And most women at Sharsharad are doing well. And breast cancer, when it's caught in its earliest stages, as you know, it certainly can be treated and, and it can even be cured. So I think we were focused not so much about my role about me, it was more that how do we serve the women and make sure that they are given the support they need and not to lose the faith that that things can be good for them and that there are things that we've learned through Rochelle's illness. This was a woman who was living for years with metastatic cancer. And I say living because she really lived life to the fullest. You know, metastatic cancer is it's almost it's, it's a separate disease than early stage breast cancer. And it's complicated. And there's a lot of good that we learned from Rochelle's experience because she was so vocal about her experience and shared it with so many on how to live side by side with cancer and how to live with metastatic breast cancer. And as the medical community community advances in treatment and ways to manage an illness. So it is a chronic illness and it eventually will be terminal. It's not today terminal. And that's what she taught about living life and making the most of what you can while you're living with this illness and explain and how to share that information with family and friends so that they could interact with you in a quote unquote normal way. I didn't fill her shoes. That wasn't my goal. But because I had been here for so many years and really it was almost like a startup and I had learned so much not only from Rochelle, but also from all the other women, we took that knowledge and that energy and that power and we held it together. And Shar Sharet is even stronger as we carry on her legacy. I was sort of asking on two fronts on the one that you were discussing, which is to have an organization that's meant to be supportive and uplifting and to have the person who started the organization pass away. Obviously, it's very devastating from like a, a morale perspective, as you're saying. But, you know, as you said, it, it's not always there to support women who are, you know, not doing well. And most people do well. And also she was diagnosed 20 years ago. It's a much different world now, fortunately, than it was 20 years ago in that regard. But also, was there a concern that maybe the organization itself would lose its momentum because she was, you know, the the initial driving force? Or, or, or were you confident that, you know, we had enough people and we already had enough momentum that it, it wouldn't uh, it, it wouldn't sort of, you know, fade. There were those naysayers. And I saw some emails come across that said, oh, what do you think is going to happen to Sharsha right now? And I was cautiously optimistic that I could do this because we had known that she eventually was going to pass away from cancer. She was very clear. So we had been planning for the transition. And, you know, I guess in any kind of new, I changed the position itself. You know, the title has changed. Right. The organization is in a very different place from where it was when she started it. And we also had a really strong team. There are a lot of staff members that have been there. Sure, Sherrod is a great place to work. You know, it's we have not only is it a meaningful experience, it's also a very positive experience. So we have staff members who've been on staff 
10 years, 12 years, 14 years with me. And so that team was able to be helpful and, and we did it together. Everyone has their doubts, but thankful to my team and to the community that overall was very supportive of my taking on this position because it is a public position. And I mean, there are things also that I've been recognized, like, for example, we work with the CDC. We help develop programs for young breast cancer survivors that serve as models for other groups. And I chair the Federal Advisory Committee on Breast Cancer and Young Women. So getting that position and having the opportunity to really work with the landscape of breast cancer support organizations across the country and across all demographics, my experience has let me do that successfully. So I did gain that kind of confidence as I was recognized externally for the work that we're doing. Yeah. And I think it also just speaks speaks to the need for what you do. It's just there are unfortunately so many people who are going through a breast cancer diagnosis or treatment or living with it, or even if they had it in the past, so to speak, that they're doing well. There's so much you know, that, that lingers in terms of whether it's financially, emotionally, socially, and there isn't really a, a place people can turn to other than you guys, or maybe some organizations like what you do for support. And I think also that need is going to keep driving you because people want you to be there. Yeah. And the truth is, we've always said that. But I think starting from March of this year, it became crystal clear how the need for Sharsharet is greater than ever. Yeah, let's let's talk about that for sure. That's huge. Like with Corona and social distancing, what's it been like? And what have you learned from that? So the model of support that we had is always been virtual. We knew about years ago that the women that we're serving, where we call them young women, but these women are self-defining what young is, women who are active, women who are working, women who are dating, women who are in the community. So these are women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, we have women in their 60s who adopted children and are raising eight-year-old children. So they're young and they didn't have time to go to in-person support groups between managing their care and managing those other things that are going on in their lives. Sharp Sharon has always brought our services to you, and we have always personalized the support to you. So it's not that your shared has the programs and tries to fit you in. Our programs are tailored to meet your needs. And everything that we have done over the years has been accessible by phone or by email or online. I mean, now either through social media, women are connecting with us. So we have eight social workers and a genetic counselor available online every day, all day, providing emotional support. We have a peer support network with over 16,000 women. So we're matching women every day. And it didn't matter to the outside world. Our services never stopped, not for one minute. It's been a change for us as a staff because we work together and we collaborate and we develop new programs and services for women based on sharing in person. And we don't have that. But the services to the women and the families that we serve, and that's caregivers too, has always been delivered by phone, email, and regular mail. So that never stopped, not for a day. You know, your support system is made up, obviously, of your medical team and your family and share, share it. And now we're finding that women who had called their moms to come babysit for their kids while they were going for surgery, their moms aren't coming. And moms whose daughters were supposed to come help them. They can't come. And Sharshard has been serving as this virtual hand to hold to help women get this. I mean, we've had women who are going in for chemo all by themselves and we're preparing things for them to listen to while they're there. They can actually speak to a social worker while they're sitting there. And we're also helping women before cancer. So we saw at the hit of Corona, a lot of women who found out that they were BRCA positive at increased genetic risk for breast cancer, hadn't really put it, the wheels into motion on putting together their medical teams. But now that they were stuck home under lockdown, we were getting calls like, help me build my medical team. Who has to be on it? What am I going to expect? Or how long is, can I speak to another woman who chose this type of surgery, this type of reconstruction? There are women who decided not to do reconstruction and want to go flat and want to consider those options. And we're connecting them with other women. So Corona only highlighted the value of the work, what we do. And we didn't have to pivot in any way, except we had to increase because the demand for both education and for information support is on the rise. Well, do you think that was 
that or also that people were becoming more comfortable with sort of that remote level of support, meaning prior to that, people might be like, well, I don't know what's a phone call going to do or a video session or an email. But then, you know, in March, everyone's like, oh, there's like so much you can do and that we're doing. And maybe it also opened what you were doing to others who maybe wouldn't have reached out in the first place. Right on the mark. And the truth is the medical community by accepting telehealth appointments validates the work that we're doing. Yeah. Things can be done over the phone. So we thank you for that because previously it wasn't like that. So you're a hundred percent right. It definitely is a different perspective and we value so much the partnership that we have with the medical community and the work that you do is so different than the work that we do, but putting it all together is really so helpful to the women from a holistic perspective as getting a whole range of services to help get them through what they're facing. I'm curious because one of the things that was interesting at the time when the COVID was peaking in our, you know, our Northeast area was for the months of like March, April, May, and even June, a lot of you know, women or anybody were not going to doctors, either because they themselves were afraid to go or because the doctor's offices were completely closed or they were only seeing emergent cases. And there was a lot of discussion about, you know, obviously the, po- you know, the positive of the lockdown to, you know, avoid getting infections, particularly people who might be sick with cancer. But on the downside, there were people who weren't getting chemotherapy or were delaying surgery or delaying their mammograms or delaying their biopsies. Did you just because you're in that world, did you see a lot of that? Were you talking to women about that? Yeah. How how are you counseling them in that situation? That must have been very difficult to navigate. That is huge. And it's still actually a concern today. If you go on to Sher Sherrod's Instagram, we're on Instagram Sher Sherrod one. One of the postings we did this week for Breast Cancer Awareness Month is don't delay your doctor's appointments. Now, if your area is open, trust your doctors. They're making it safe. We are encouraging women to go to their doctor's appointments. But the questions that you're asking where we were getting them by the drove, you know, right. the phone's ringing off the hook. So what we did was that we set up a webinar series with top oncologists and all everyone from the medical team to speak directly to women. So we would set up these webinars with one or two days notice. What's the hot topic of the day? So COVID and cancer within two days, we did a, a webinar with like 800 people registered and they were able to ask their questions. You know, what if I'm on this chemotherapy now? And what happens if they said, now I only need five and I was supposed to have eight. And while we don't give direct medical advice, we give them guidance on how to speak to their doctors and what is the general understanding of what's okay. And sometimes chemotherapies could be spread out and be safe and not put your life at risk. And then there were some questions that you can ask that you can get things done even during lockdown. So that's how, from a social worker's perspective, we can help them with that. But we even brought the medical community directly to the women so that they could ask this question. And then women also were supporting each other through these webinars because questions would be asked that 20 of them had the same question. And there we they had the top professional providing general information, not direct medical advice. We still encouraged women to check in with their healthcare professionals, but this alleviated fears, helped give them guidance, gave them the questions to ask, help them take the next steps so that they wouldn't put their lives at risk. But there is still an issue of people delaying screenings and other medical procedures. So we are actively, we have a story on our blog, we've been posting on social media, and every social worker that speaks to women about this topic encourages them to call their doctors. If you have to start with a telehealth, you can do that. And medical offices are reassuring us, as I'm sure you are, that they're taking the necessary precautions to keep the environment safe. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The medical offices are all doing that because all of us recognize the importance of what we're doing. And for people to not come just because they're afraid, okay, if it's a completely elective or routine visit, fine, you know, push it off. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about visits that are necessary. When you say the medical community, you know, you don't have doctors like on staff in your organization. So how do you make that connection? Do you have specific people who are like on your, so to speak, Rolodex, you know, for our younger listeners out there, that's a paper thing. And how do you do that? How does that work? Do you have doctors who want to come on or do you have to like twist their arms to come and you know do this? What happens? First of all, we have a medical advisory board mm-hmm. that has doctors who affiliate with all the different 
affiliations that go along with breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So they are, like you said, on our speed dial. That is our Rolodex. And these are very well-known, very well-respected doctors. And in addition to that, we are partnering with a medical center. So even if a doctor is not on our board necessarily, on our medical board, we're working with them. So we have formalized partnerships like with Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Center, like with Cedar sinai in LA, Sylvester in Miami. And so we are to have these relationships. So any doctor that we reach out to, if they have the time, they are happy to come on and help women. And we make it very easy for them and set it up for them. And the Zoom thing, you know, this is the culture that everyone's used to. So technology has allowed us to really bring the women's voices with the doctor's guidance together. So that's been good. Most doctors are really happy to do that. It's especially if it's easy. I mean, if it's one thing you have to drive six hours to some convention center, all right, fine, that's like a full day. But to get on a, you know, a webinar or a podcast or whatever it is for a half hour, for an hour, or even longer, doctors are really excited about this. You know, most of us who go into healthcare, there's a reason we do it. And if there's something that's going to be valuable to women, people are more than happy to take the time to explain it and answer their questions, particularly when things come up like with COVID. And I would imagine you probably have more volunteers on the doctor's end than you even have opportunities for them to to speak and do these things. Yeah, we do. And, and we're grateful for that because unfortunately, we're still dealing with this predicament and yeah. the questions and they're evolving and they're on the cusp of what's happening. The truth is we also have been able to archive them. So all of these, all these virtual conferences, they're on webinar, they're all saved on our website and they can be accessed for free. They can be, there are written transcripts, there are videos, people can figure out, they can see what they want to see. They don't have to see everything. And it's been tremendously helpful to have the experts on the line with us. And the medical community is busy right now, hopefully. I mean, I actually just had my mammogram today. Good for you. That it went well today and I felt very safe. And I encourage everyone who has not gotten one in the last year or so who's over 40 should definitely schedule your appointment. You know, I'm grateful. This was a good result for me today. And we are telling people to go to the doctor. Go call your doctor, set up an appointment. So actually we do evaluations after all these webinars and the feedback from the women and the speakers are like, this is tremendously valuable. Please do it again. You know, we appreciate it. And then we find out what topics they want to talk about. And that's what we're presenting. It's great. So, you know, we've been talking sort of peripherally about the things you do, but I wanted to talk directly about all of the services you provide just so our listeners can understand the scope of what you're doing. Because it's, it's quite vast. You know, you you guys do a lot. And so I, I definitely wanted to go into that. We can start anywhere you want. If you can just rattle them off or I can just, you know, go into each topic about how you support women. You know, what are the services you provide for women and their families? So what I've learned over these years is like, if I'm talking on this podcast, people have a certain capacity of what they could remember. So I'm going to keep it really tight. So everyone <laughs> really gets what we do. There are two buckets of areas. When you think about Sher Sherrod and you think about breast cancer, why are you going to Sher Sherrod? One is for one-on-one support. That means it's individualized. It's all about you and your family. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we educate the broader community about their risk and the measures they can take to protect the health. So that we're improving lives through this one-on-one support and we are saving lives through educational outreach. So when I talk about one-on-one support, this is through a multimodal way of support. We have a national peer support network where women who share similar experiences can be matched. And we have mental health professionals on staff, the social workers and genetic counselor. And we also provide financial subsidies for non-medical services that may not be covered completely by insurance or even at all by insurance that improve quality of life. So that's the one-on-one support, peer support, a mental health professional, and financial subsidies. And in the education, we're out there. If you are on college campuses, we are National Philanthropy for 85. So thousands of students across the country, I don't know if they're on campus now in real life or if they're <laughs> right. But if you go on, they're doing events that raise awareness because we talk to these young adults and we tell them like, this is not about your grandmother's breast cancer, which is important too, but this is about you. And you as a young adult can do things today to protect your future. And we are working with them. We raise awareness about the genetic risk. And certainly in the Ashkenazi Jewish community, that one in 40 Jews of Ashkenazi descent carries a BRCA mutation. And that kids as young as you know 18 to 24 can speak to their family about their family history and see if cancers run in their family. And we know that this, the BRCA breast cancer gene also increases the risk for prostate cancer and male breast cancer and melanoma and pancreatic cancer. So 
this is not only about educating women, it's about educating men and women about their risk. So this starts on college campuses and through the community and adults of all ages. And we educate about other genetic mutations that are running through families so that people have knowledge and the knowledge is power. And then they talk to their doctors. We know for a fact that we've saved lives, that people who come to these educational events are listening to podcasts like this, and then they talk to their doctor. And then they find out that something's going on and they can take care of it because it's early. So that's what we do. One-on-one support and education and outreach. Yeah. And listen, obviously, I I totally agree that all of these, you know, and the one-on-one support, it's so critical for women going through this or, you know, have questions or need, you know, need support or want support, or even if they don't, it's going to be helpful, obviously. And then in the education that that is huge in terms of, you know, prevention and treatment and saving lives. You said you had... It was eight social workers and a genetic counselor. So how many people are they in touch with on a given day, month, year? I mean, you mentioned you know, thousands so and thousands. We're helping about 400 unique women a month. 400 unique women a month. And that's, I mean, that's a lot. Right. And it's also their it's also their families, right? It's really the whole unit because every person's circle is different. And so it, right. it may not just be her, but let's say she has to go through you know, chemo or radiation or surgery, you know, and she has kids, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot that has to be supported under that circumstance. Yeah. So for example, young moms who are going through it, we have a program called busy box and we create a box of toys based on the ages of the children with appropriate toys that are not messy and really good resources for the parents. And we mail that to a woman's house. So when she is resting after treatment or when she's at the doctor, you can take out a toy and it keeps the kids busy. And it, it's been so well received. All the toys are donated and they're good quality. And then the resources in the packet are for the mom and the parents on resources that can help them, articles that are valuable. And we have social workers who will help them. How do they talk to their kids about the cancer journey? And different ages have different needs. And how do you manage their responses? And we've also expanded this program to women who are doing prophylactic surgeries, who find out that they have a genetic mutation that increases their risk. How do they talk to their kids about that? And how do they explain the surgery in an age-appropriate way? So that's one of the examples that we are sending these quality-of-life kits to women's homes that have nice product, which is really nice to give to these kids and also helpful resources to guide the parents and provide parenting tips. And everything is with a human being. Like we are, with this day and age of technology, we are focused on making sure that everybody speaks with a human being if they want to, so that it's not just, oh, you get the scent and that's you're on your own. We're really here for you for the biggest questions and the smallest questions. And in terms of the the 400, you know, unique women a month, what, where are they from? Uh, all over the world, all over the country? Where are they congregated? So we're U.S.-based and we have these regional offices. So we tend to get the bulk of the women calling from the areas surrounding our physical structures. So, for example, New York, New Jersey, Florida, California, and Illinois. But now we're seeing it's more regional. So we are actually have callers from all 50 states. We also have, we are U.S.-based, but, you know, Canada is our next door neighbor. We have women calling from Canada. We've had women calling from Israel, women from Hong Kong, women from Switzerland. Generally, they're coming from the U.S. We've had women from South Africa, Australia, U.S. Virgin Islands. They're finding us in all these crazy places. And we always ask people, where'd you find out about us? You know, a lot of times it's coming because somebody runs a race and they put it on their Facebook. And I think I think you might be a Shar Sherrod athlete. 2011, New York City Marathon. I ran it. I have the pink shirt, the Shar Sherrod shirt. It was great. Think about all the people that sponsored you. First of all, we're so grateful for the funds and also grateful for the outreach that you did because every single person who gave a donation now knows about Char Sherrod. So very often we'll hear someone who says, oh, you know, my cousin who lives in Wisconsin, you you came in for the New York City Marathon and I gave a donation and I never thought I would need you, but I'm calling you now. So they're calling from all 50 states. Well, yeah, I never realized that. Obviously, I knew that the races that you you know participate in are great fundraisers, but I totally, you know, never thought about the fact that they're also really good to just raise awareness because it just increases your net by that many people in every photo. And you have the, you know, people ask what you're running for, what do they do? And and never actually thought about that aspect of it, but that must be huge in terms of your visibility. It's huge, but that's also a Corona consequence, right? There's no more racing. I mean, there's virtual racing, but it's just not the same. So we miss that. I mean, as much as our programs, so women who need Sharon have their support that we need, We are missing the opportunity 
to come together in person for races, for luncheons, for ways where we can, women love to see women, you know, we match women. So for example, we had a woman let's in Miami who was matched with a woman in New York to share experiences. And then we had an event and they actually met in person. And that kind of first time seeing each other in person, connecting, that we're not going to be able to have now for a while. So we're doing our best to connect people through these virtual events. We had one in July called Midsummer Miracles. And we actually have a comedy show coming up November 16th that these are virtual. They're fundraisers, but it's also women are coming onto the call. So we knew that these two women, different women, not the one from Miami, New York, but a different women from across the country, LA and New York, they were both watching the Sharsharet event in July, a virtual event, and they started texting each other. Uh, they hadn't spoken in a while, and they started texting each other, and they ended up talking about what was going on with them now, that they didn't think they needed each other. And because Sharsharet had this event, it brought them together. That's a shame that we can't do these in-person events for a while. How does it work for most people who end up, you know, as a part of those, you know, women who are getting your services or and somebody, what happens? Do they just like phone your main office and say, hey, I just got diagnosed or hey, I'm about to get a biopsy. Like, what do I do? Or do people call with specific questions and then they sort of find out about the other services? Like what's a typical entry for a woman or family into the Sharsharet world? So the answer to the question is yes, 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 yes. That's how they <laughs> Everyone has a different story, but they're, we have it set up that really women are calling at every stage. And a lot of times it's not the woman who makes the call. It's a hard call to make when you're diagnosed or you think you might be diagnosed. I mean, we have a lot of women who call even for that waiting period, right? When when the doctor tells you they saw something and they're going for the biopsy and they don't get the results right away, who do they talk to? They're not ready to tell their friends yet because it may, be, it may not be anything to tell their friends. And they themselves haven't really accepted what's going on. And they don't want to, we don't want them to start writing fiction. They don't know the answer yet. So Star Shara can step in and help you through that waiting period. That's a really hard time for a lot of women. So women are reaching out either with a phone call at that point. A lot of times it's, it could be a family friend or a partner, a, a spouse, a parent, a best friend, a ch an adult child. So they can reach out. We also have live chat. So we know when this stuff is going on, people can't sleep at night. So they can reach out. We have a counselor on staff at night. We have LA hours. So we're, we're open a lot. <laughs> you know, you can reach us at any time and someone will get back to you. So you can say, okay, I'll speak to someone at nine in the morning and go to sleep. So they're reaching out on live chat. We're getting questions on Facebook and Instagram, even LinkedIn. People are reaching us and asking questions, but sometimes we get people who want to talk every single week and go through their whole thing with us. And sometimes people just want a couple of questions answered to get them going on their way. And we're fine. Our goal is to empower women to take this next step and take control. And if that means that we have to be there every day, for a month, we will do that. And if that means it's once a month, we'll do that too. And our team is constantly checking up on women three months later, six months later, nine months later. So from that initial phone call, you're never a stranger. You're already a friend. And does it work that like, let's say a family member calls and says, hey, my sister was just diagnosed. She seems like she's having a, a rough time or she needs this. How can I help her? Is, how does that work? Is this something where you know, you would reach out to the sister, you say, you know what, the sister has to call us or how do you navigate that? So we are very cognizant of privacy right. and confidentiality. So even if, like, I remember when I came to Sher Sharon and Rochelle and I were talking about like confidentiality and people are going to come over to you in the community and say, oh, thank you so much for helping my sister. I could not say to that person, Oh, yeah, but I, I would say, you know, I'm glad your sister feels supported, but, you know, right. I don't know if she called her shared and even if I did, I couldn't tell you. So and even within my own family. So confidentiality, everything is under lock and key at Sher Sherrod. Nobody shares information. I don't know the women who call Sher Sherrod unless they're calling me directly. We everything is confidential. And when women want to share their experience, that's their decision. But at Sher Sherrod, no one will know it. So if a, someone, a family member calls and says, for example, like you said, my sister isn't feeling, isn't doing well. We will not reach out to that sister. Right. We will say to you, if you want, here is my number, give it to your sister. If your sister or do an email introduction where your sister approves it, then we will get involved and we can give you everything to give your sister. So for example, if you tell us that your sister is going through surgery and we have this amazing pillow of support, that's beautiful and helpful and we could say to you, look, I'll send it to you. 
and you can give it to your sister, but I will not put that uh, sister's name anywhere right. until she herself is ready to make the call. At the end of the day, she is the boss. She decides what's public, but we can still work. There are women, I guess, maybe that never called us, but we are helping the sister or the husband all the way. We had a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer whose mom called us and how we could help her. So we, and she told us she was going for surgery and we told her, okay, this is what you need to do. And and the mother needed some help because this is her second child going through a cancer experience. So we said, okay, you know, we're going to send you a pillow. And, and, the, and the daughter had an interesting first name, but a different last name than her mom. Fine. Then a couple of days later, we get a call from someone's husband. My, my, my wife is going surgery and I need this kind of help. And can you help me? And I need it by tomorrow. We said, oh, she's having surgery. And then we said, okay. And then we said, oh, maybe we'll send her a pillow. And then we realized that she got three pillows. It was the same woman. <laughs> but we, but we realized like we would not know that everybody yeah. had a different last name. It was, you know, but the point was that it's so confidential. We don't know. And we would, and we wouldn't let the husband know that the mother called and, and, you know, that's the way it is. And when the family's ready to be public, that's their decision, not ours. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And if someone calls and, and they speak to a social worker, let's say, do you guys internally do it that, you know, each woman is assigned one social worker? Or is it like a team approach where you guys discuss, you know, cases and what can we do? And how do you sort of navigate that, the sort of one-on-one -on -one individual with, with a specific social worker versus your whole team of professionals? So we we write down, we have a proprietary database that we've created that stores all this information that is password protected and people can't get into it. But generally women, as they develop a relationship with a social worker, can ask to speak to them again. But for example, Sometimes women want to know, you know, I'm going tomorrow for, to my plastic surgeon. I just want to know a couple of questions, but that person might be on vacation that day. Or, I mean, for your, we have someone on maternity leave every, every month. So sometimes <laughs> social worker could, yeah, you know. That's it's, wonderful. Uh, you know, that is great news. It's, it's a growing share share family. We have a lot of share share babies. So social workers can be out for you yeah. know, a few months at a time. So we have all team members are able to keep up with different cases. And as a team, they do have weekly meetings where they discuss cases and help each other discuss best practices, but without using names. But if a woman is in the system and a social worker that she feels that, that she uses all the time, but we can get that information and we can help her get to that doctor's appointment with all the tools she needs. Right. And I think one of the really interesting things about Shar Sharat that I suspect a lot of our listeners don't know, certainly the ones who have not heard about you before, but even the ones who know you very well is even though Shar Sharat, you know, it's a Hebrew word and it was started by, you know, a Jewish woman, a Jewish community, you're not uniquely there for Jewish women. You're there for all women. Yeah. I mean, our focus is Jewish. So right. you will see Jewish on everything. Okay. We did a survey and 20% of the women who reach out to Shar Sharat are not Jewish. Right. But we're also finding, which is so interesting in this day and age, is that because of all of the ancestry types of kits that people are taking and finding out, and one of the things that, like, for example, 23andMe mm -hmm. is an organization, a company that for entertainment purposes, you can find out all about your ancestry. And they happen to also ask about BRCA, about BRCA testing. So we are finding out that women, for the first time, who never knew they were Jewish, but because they have Ashkenazi Jewish blood, are calling Sharsharet because they they know that we have an expertise in this area. So it's the first time that we're finding women who never even knew that they had any kind of uh, Jewish connection or connecting to Sharsharet. But yes, we help every woman and man who reaches out to us for support. And our expertise is, is in breast and ovarian cancer. And we often get calls about other cancers where we offer them the support that we have that relate to breast and ovarian cancer. And if they want to take advantage of it, terrific. And if it's not, because it's not so specific, we have partners in the cancer community where we can refer them to so they can get very specific support that they need for the cancer that they are living with. Right. And how do you support all your programming? So Sharsharet fundraising model is we have a lot of individual donors from the community. So that's one revenue stream. Another revenue stream is we have one government grant from the CDC 
that we have been getting for about eight years working on a cooperative agreement with the CDC. We also get support from pharmaceutical companies who are bringing drugs to market that target breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and BRCA-related diseases, and laboratories who are doing screening for cancer and genetic mutations that are related to breast and ovarian cancer. And we often serve as consultants, providing them with the patient perspective so that they can hear the patient's voice. And we represent that. So that's funding. And then and then the last funding is family foundations. So we don't really get so much institutional funding, but there are family foundations that are supporting Shoshara. And our budget is four point seven million dollars. Wow. That's uh that's an impressive budget. That's uh, I mean that's that just indicates how much you're doing. Yeah. A lot of people when you think about how many people share share it touches in a year, we estimate based on the numbers of the people we actually have names for, mm -hmm. we're over 150,000. But we know there are times we get calls from people and they say, I just want to thank you so much. You really helped me get through my cancer. And I was like, I don't know them. Their name is not, I never heard of them. And no one's heard of them. Their names are not in our database because they're watching a video or they come to an event or they don't share their contact information. And that's okay for us. Like we, we, love to hear that we were there for people. The worst thing is to hear from someone who says, you know, I wish I knew about you when I needed you most. So we really want people to know who we are so that ultimately my goal is to ensure that everybody knows about Sharsharit should they ever need us. Right. I mean, in finding you, as long as you know the word Sharsharit, they're going to find you because, you know, I mean, you Google, Instagram, Facebook, wherever it is. I mean, you're the only ones that are Sharsharit with the with the bow. I mean, so it's it's fortunately you guys have a you know, a name that's unique enough that all people have to do is type it in and they'll find you. Yeah. So it's really hard to type it right. So yeah. most people spell it wrong. So we put on our website misspelled names of Sher Sheridan. And it's not because I don't have good, uh, you know, proofers, but we know that people spell it wrong. So you'll see on some of our pages, it says, you know, Sher Sherit is spelled Sher Sherit with an E and we, and not with an A. So that the misspelling is also on our website so people can find us. We've been working a lot on our SEO and making sure that different Google searches will bring our name up to the top so that people can find us and it's easy. Right. So I, I wanted to, to wrap up. I wanted to ask you basically three questions sort of on a, on a like an overview level. The first would be there's so much that I'm certain you're proud of in regards to Shar Sherit and, and your involvement with Share Share, but if you were to highlight something that you were either the most proud of or one of the things you're most proud of in regards to what you're doing at Share Share, what, what would that be? It could be a story or it could be just a specific you know, program that you started or warms your heart when you're having a, a tough day at work, let's say. I think what we're most proud of is the feedback we get from women and the stories we share. Everything is about stories. Every Wednesday, we bring together our staff from all over the country. Now it's it's not so unique because everybody does Zoom, but, but even before COVID. And we start off every staff meeting with a story from our team of social workers of a woman from where she was before she reached out to where she is today because of Char Sharad. Those are the stories that when I go out there and I talk about Char Sharad, like I said, people aren't going to remember the exact details, but they'll remember the stories of the women who started in the beginning feeling vulnerable, maybe even as a victim, and they come out after Sher Sherrod and want to help others. And I think that that's what I'm most proud about, this feeling that I came to Sher Sherrod when I needed you, how can I help women now? How can I help someone else? So women who were reached out to us for support now sign up to be peer supporters. I think that that's an unbelievable proud moment for us as an organization to provide that platform, which we know is part of the healing process where you can reach out beyond yourself, take your experience and help other women. Wow, that's amazing. And then the, the second thing is sort of looking to the future of your organization. In addition to just, you know, doing what you're doing maybe for more women, do you have any thoughts about, you know, areas that need to be addressed or, you know, big needs in the communities that you see that maybe one day you can help fill that void? So one of the things that we started to do on a very small scale were these financial subsidies for non-medical services. I think that as this pandemic continues, I do believe that financial instability is going to become a big challenge and with healthcare. So I would like Char Sherrett to be even more of an expert when it comes to policy 
and advocacy. Not that that's our mission, not that that we do it, but we should understand it and be able to educate our women about that even more than we're doing it now. So we're actively looking for board members and others to come who can share that that kind of expertise with the women that we serve. Because I think that it's going to get difficult for people and, and the world that it, it's hard. So if we could have raise more money to be able to give out more money and also help women better understand and navigate the system, even you know with the changes that are happening, that's where we want to become experts. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge area. I mean, for, you know, women, they say, okay, you know, they're dealing with the diagnosis and, you know, that's like an anvil that dropped on their head and, you know, they can finally figure out, okay, I need to see this doctor do that. And then they find out, you know, she doesn't take my insurance. Like, oh, you know, and then it's like, now what do I do? And it's like a whole other world of, of pain that people go through in this and uh, totally. Yeah, we're doing that on a small scale and we are doing that. So when women call, but we could do more of that. And I think that times are going to change. So I want to make sure that we stay on the cusp of the changes so that we are equipped to really help women navigate. And the final thing is, you know, you, you've been involved in this world for 15 to 20 years now, and thousands and thousands of women have come to you and your organization for help. And if one of our listeners is out there and she herself was recently diagnosed breast cancer or a family member, or she thinks she may have it, what advice would you give to her? What's the message you would have to her right now? about this journey she's about to embark on? That everyone's story is their own. And while it's helpful to speak to other people, no two people have the same diagnosis, no two people have the same story, and everyone is going on their own path. So learn from others, but remain yourself. And Shashara can help you do that. And I think if you, you can call or someone else can call and we can help you learn from others, but live your story. Because I think that you look around, there's so much information out there. And I would tell you not to go on the internet alone. I think there's so much information out there. It could be confusing. It could be scary. And you'll think that everything that you see applies to you. And it's just not true. Everyone is unique. And that's how Shershare treats you. And when you call Shershare, you're the only person in the room. And we will work with you on your story and your journey. And there's a lot of good things out there that can help you get through it. And we can help you through that. It's amazing. Alana, thank you so much. First, you know, on a simple level, just for coming on, taking the time and talking to me so our listeners can hear about all the wonderful things you do and hopefully, you know, either get involved themselves by just checking out your website or volunteering or donating, or if there are people who need your services, but also ob obviously on a bigger level, just for doing what you do. I mean, I've, you know, I've known about Shashar for a long time. Like you said, I obviously know many people who have had breast cancer and have done, you know, patients, friends, family who have you know, range from doing very, very well to sort of ha living with this diagnosis to obviously people have unfortunately passed away. And, you know, I've known the Cheshire, it's a great organization. I'm happy to support you guys, but it's just amazing to to hear what you're doing and how you've grown and how professional you all are and what you provide. It's really inspiring to those of us out there that, that you're there, that you're there for women. Well, I really appreciate that. And, and, you know, we always say like, I would love to, you know, I used to say I'll retire when I have grandchildren. But I'm still here. <laughs> Apparently not. Um, and, and the truth is, you know, we would love to close up shop for a lack of need until we get to that day. Sure, sure. It's going to be around. We're going to be there because we see that it makes a difference. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.